close by singing the African national anthem, Kosi Sikelele Africa. God bless Africa. And um, welcome to the fifth day of the fifth annual Spirit of Peace and Prosperity Conference organized by African Views Organization. Before we start, I would like to um, make some housekeeping rules. Please ensure that your mics are muted at all times unless the moderator has called on you to um, speak. Also, uh, please don't unmute your mic to interject when a speaker is speaking. You can use the raise hand feature, the icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can raise your hand and the moderator will call you as appropriate. You can also send in um, chat requests if you would like to make a comment or if you would like to contribute or add to the um, discussion. Um, also, please remember that this uh, session today from 12 noon until the closing will be recorded. Thank you very much. And I, I, I now hand over to 
uh, Dr. William Verdon, who is the board chairman of the African Views Organization. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. Good afternoon or good morning, as you've mentioned, ladies and gentlemen. This is the last of these presentations from African Views Organization. My name, as she mentioned, is William A. Verdone, and I am chairman, and I have a few brief comments. This year, because of the devastating effects of COVID-19, we decided to present our fifth annual Spirit of Peace and Prosperity Summit through internet technology. I also think of this as prosperity through peace. But first, I want to acknowledge our executive director, Dr. Wali Idris Ajibade, for his tireless work in organizing the symposia. And I include our exceptional board of directors and outstanding personnel behind the scenes. Ambassador Isaiah Shabala from Zambia, our most distinguished board member, will discuss today the timely emergence of the Royal African Institute, a major endeavor in promoting cooperation between African kingdoms and for working to obtain observer status at the United Nations as Palestine and the Vatican have. Ambassador Shabala is a powerhouse of goodwill and accomplishment and a major voice for African views. In conclusion, I want to thank every participant who contributed his or her time and expertise in making these past five days a most successful undertaking. There is an old saying that many of you already know, the journey of 10,000 miles begins with that first step. Ladies and gentlemen, we have taken those first steps. Our vision is closer. Now it's time to run. Thank you, and please stay safe. Thank you very much, Mr. Vadan. Thank you so much. Thank you for your leadership over the years, for your guidance, and for your vision. Thank you so much. You are a pillar to us and uh, quite a compliment. Uh, I will ask uh, the uh, Honorable El Malik to please keep the mic muted. I want to quickly acknowledge our royal fathers who are here. His Royal Majesty King Adida Kwaderemi, the Alaya Mori of Idoshan, is here with us. May your reign last. Welcome, sir. I am so happy and glad that His Royal Highness Emanuhu Mohammed Sanusi is here with us. He is the uh, Emma of. Um, uh, is the Emir of uh, 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 Dutse in uh, Jigawa State. Uh, he is, if, oh gosh, I was reading your, I did not know you'd published, sir. So I was reading your uh, publication. I am so excited about your scholarship. And it just uh, really opens another wider horizon. Now I understand uh, what you have been um telling me and telling us about your effort and how you're able to strategize in such a difficult environment. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Welcome. I want to acknowledge Queen Nana Awindo. Um, Nana Ima Awindo uh, from Ghana. Thank you so much. Welcome to the forum today. This is very very special and your voice is so important here because you have witnessed the process so we want you to learn a voice here welcome allow me to welcome also all the other nanas that i'm yet to meet um, we will introduce you accordingly and we'll get your voice in um, welcome and i also want to uh, say a quick hello and uh, welcome to our dear friend 
uh, chief in uh, Senegal. Thank you for taking the time. Your presence here is so important. Uh, in addition to that, I will also quickly say hello to a very dear friend from Nepal who uh, is representing the king from the Philippines, uh, who has shown great support for our cause uh, here today. Welcome, Pradeep Sapkota. Thank you so much. Um, is the, <clears throat> is the uh, adopted prince of the Philippines. And uh, it's a beautiful crossover from Nepal uh, to the Philippines. And uh, we see good relationship there. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, to move this quickly forward, I will just like to acknowledge the presence of um, really a great man who has been uh, the driver uh, and the pilot of our organization's vision. Um, His Excellency Ambassador Isaiah Shabala, uh, who is going to be very instrumental to uh, the, the course that we have at hand and the vision that we have with our royal elders. Ambassador, thank you so much for your time. I know uh, you, you have multiple challenges of scheduling today, but you are here with us. Uh, we are indeed very grateful. Thank you and welcome to the forum. So today uh, marks the fifth day of um, the Spirit of Peace Conference. And uh, the fifth day is the last day tell you uh, it has been a remarkable experience in the last uh, four days or so, today being the fifth one. Um, remarkable, remarkable uh, experiences touching on different subjects. We started with World Prayers for Peace, which is traditional to the Spirit of Peace and Prosperity Summit. And this World Prayer for Peace is obviously to bring different spiritual leaders, different spiritual elements, uh, religious leaders together. We were successful in doing so this year. Uh, we'll be providing videos of these experiences and I, and assure you they are remarkable. So all these leaders came together from wide and far. We reached people who came from Japan, India, uh, other places around the world, uh, Africa, here, Europe. Uh, it, it, was, it was remarkable. And uh, the idea is to lend uh, um, a, a, a direction, uh, we, uh, you know, way forward, uh, how we chart and how we bless the path and how we ask God for help uh, and, and reassurance in God, our trust in God in the process and in our deliberation. And uh, people say that uh, really have they seen God celebrated the way we have. So I'm really proud of our work uh, and our inclusivity. Uh, the second day uh, was Nelson Mandela Day. This Nelson Mandela Day uh, really is the anchor and the basis for the Spirit of Peace and Prosperity uh, Summit. Uh, the Mandela Day is July 18th, which is the um, which is the uh, uh, the Mandela International Day as declared by the United Nations. So <clears throat> this Mandela Day is really the basis and the wraparound for the uh, Spirit of Peace and uh, Prosperity Conference. Uh, we again do this because we honor and promote the legacy of Nelson Mandela, hence the Spirit of Peace. Um, this year was so wonderful. Uh, we had the blessings of uh, Nelson Mandela's grandson, and um, as you may have heard recently, uh, Mandela's third daughter, Zinzi, uh, passed away uh, just a few days before the birthday. Uh, while we're very saddened about this, I want to raise one thing that concerns me personally. Mandela, I believe around 1969, lost his first son. And his son passed away on the same day that the daughter passed away few weeks ago. That caused a lot of concern. And as we Africans know, that's a signal that's, uh, that needs to be observed. So we know that there is a very high cost to the path that we run and the challenges that we face.
uh, this, this comes with a, a great deal of sacrifices and a great deal of demand. So um, I want us to please put the Mandela's family in your prayers uh, that they are protected and that their legacy continue to flourish and nourish us all in our different spheres of life. So the Nelson Mandela Day this year was really a remarkable event. We had um, many youth presented their vision. We, we, we asked them for candor and they were candid. Uh, there are some who disagreed and some who supported, but, but all are in agreement that Mandela uh, legacy is uh, benevolent. So on uh, the day after that, which is the third day of the Spirit of Peace event, we had um, trade and investments. Uh, the, the title of that program is um, uh, uh, trading uh, and investing in peace. So we, we say uh, the culture of trading and investing in peace. And this is very, very important. When we talk about peace, we're not talking about just the absence of war. Uh, people think peace is a tranquility, maybe lying by the ocean and enjoying uh, the breezes or whatever the case may be. But peace is just the way we do things. It's the right things in the right place. Um, order, orderliness, things like that. These are the things that bring peace to the society. So this is uh, why it is important for cultural and economics to come together in order to chat the way forward for peace. And if you look at it closely, you'll see that symbiotic relationship there. It's in fact inseparable that institu financial institutions are not just there as edifices, they are unifying factors. The banks are there uh, uh, because they are unifying factors. That's where we all go to put our money. And it's important we begin to think like that when we, when we uh, begin to, 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 to understand more what unity means. I mean, unity is not just raising our fist and saying, kumbaya, let's go, let's unite. No, these institutions that we build there are the unifying factors. This is why our uh, religious uh, places are important. Uh, and uh, this is why, most importantly for me, in my understanding, uh, especially in the African context, that our custodians of culture, our uh, 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 traditional authorities, uh, our customary authorities, uh, who, some of who are present here today, are uh, incredibly important uh, because they are unifying factors. They embody that not only in their institutional presence, but also in their own beings. And I've been fortunate to meet so many of them. And I can't tell you how proud, how proud I am of, 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 of these beings that are cultivated, acculturated to guide us and to lead us, which is why I think we must tap more into this. So our effort on Wednesday, uh, on, on the third day, which is uh, the culture of, of uh, trading and investing in peace, really is to bring the awareness of the existence of uh, stock exchanges, I mean, stock exchanges and commodity exchanges to begin to talk together and work together across the African countries and the Caribbean countries, because the Caribbean countries are nations that have their own sovereignty. So even if they're in the Commonwealth, they are still able to work together uh, in such a way that serves the people. And that's why it is important for them to recognize the role of culture in trade. So uh, we were able to do that with the help of uh, many friends who were experts uh, in, 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 in financial and economic terms. And uh, we were able to um, make uh, a very important uh, 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 deduction about how we can begin to move forward. We see that we don't talk to each other enough. We don't trade with each other. And we don't trade with each other because we don't know each other. People see us as Africans, but we are so diverse. We know how diverse we are. So diverse in our ethnicity, in our languages, in so many things. And, uh, you know, and even politics complicates it even more. Which is what brought us to the fourth day of the program. 
African identity and restitutions of African arts. African heritage arts, as you know, were taken from Africa pre-colonizations and during colonization. There are many movies that are done about that. Um, and when these artifacts are taken, a lot went with it. They're not just artifacts in the African context, right? They, they serve purpose, they serve particular purposes. So when these things were removed, oftentimes, uh, you know, the soul of the society or at least a portion of it was taken as well. Um, and, and even the, the symbolicity of, of that uh, keeps us uh, challenged by a vacuum that is left by that uh, removal. Not only uh, did we not benefit, we, well, we're not able to benefit from all of these uh, value uh, artifacts taken, they were used to benefit the development and civilization of the colonialists. Many of the very famous artists like Picasso and all, all the rest of the avant-garde crew took their inspiration from many of these artifacts. So that means they could benefit from it and without the benefit of the original artist, without acknowledging the artist. With, so all of these things sound complicated, but they are very, very important. They're important because what those artifact means is to show that ancestors were deliberate, visionary, and intelligent. That's all these things tell us. That's teaching and giving us so much strength to recognize our potential in the present. Anyway, there's been a lot of work in the <clears throat> to restore this artifact. But the arguments on the table is that Africa at this present does not have enough sophisticated museums to actually house and protect and preserve this artifact. Now this argument sounds really interesting and it's back and forth and some say no, but you know, it's been a long time, we own it now, or perhaps the Africans don't appreciate it. As this debate begin to go on, we recognize the vacuum. Not only does it affect self-esteem, we see the result of that in our youth today. Maybe it is the way they dress, maybe it is the way they talk, uh, maybe it is the way they do their hair uh, and, uh, or bleach their screen, skins and all this identity crises that all these things are causing. And I tell you the relationship there is that when precious inspirational materials are created over the years, whether it's technology, science, whatever the case may be. And there is no acknowledgement uh, for the African participation in it. There's the vacuum obviously affects the present and the future in the sense that people think they are, they, they, they've not done anything of, 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 of value. So the adherence uh, is obviously focused to the uh, uh, to, to, to some certain kind of authoritative culture, uh, which seems to have created all of this. So these are the things that we are, that we are trying to, uh, we are trying to uh, modify and, um, and, and, and uh, uh, put in place. So we, um, so anyway, um, when we, uh, when we look at these things, um, we realize, uh, uh, just, just to uh, finish on the uh, identity crisis, the, the identity crisis has to do obviously uh, with so much uh, money. Let's look at it from economic terms. Money that's going from our communities uh, to uh, uh, beauty care or, 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 or foreign fashion or all of those things that you can imagine uh, uh, that's affecting uh, and all these foreign uh, influences. Not that the influences are not great, but many of them have uh, some tremendous uh, adverse effect on our development. Here in the United States and many parts of Africa, we see the trend of pan sagging. Uh, we see the trends of uh, 
uh, uh, uh, buying foreign hair to uh, it's, 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 so we, we look at all of these crises and putting all of that together uh, looking for where we need to begin to make repair now you can imagine that this is this a really great uh, uh, challenges and as one of our elders have said Leopold Senghor when you are lost and things look bleak you turn to culture because culture is our moral compass. So here we are. That's why we have decided and deliberated over the years that we must include culture in every aspect of sustainable development. And I could not be happier that we arrived at that conclusion because I know it leads directly to our kingdoms. If we are to repair anything, we have to start at these kingdoms levels because it is from the kingdoms that slaves were taken. It is from the kingdoms that nations were taken. It is our kingdoms that were destroyed. When the kingdoms were destroyed, the ways of life of our people became a, a, a far-fetched idea and we have no more basis but to look for elsewhere for value so beginning to restore this is incredibly important and yes we cannot change the past but sure we can change today so that we have a better future for all this is why we've reached out to our elders this is why we have asked them to come to the table. And this is why we are extremely grateful that while we thought we're the only one thinking that way, we found them already light year ahead and prepared and waiting for us with this same idea. So it is with this effort that we drafted something called the Royal Institute of Global African Cultures and Traditions. We brought so many scholars together to uh, deliberate on this, the importance of this, and the next challenge would be how do we get our kings involved? And since we know that some, and perhaps even many, already agreed to this idea, uh, we have been pushing this for the last five years. And we have made tremendous progress because today you will see the progress that we have made with the Royal African Institute for short, which is the Royal Institute of Global African Cultures and Traditions. More than that, much more than that, what we want is the unification of all our leaders, our cultural leaders in this sense, to speak in one voice and have an observation, uh, observance presence, uh, 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 observer presence at the United Nations. This is important because it is United Nations and United Nations is doing its best to be encompassing. It has to be, otherwise it will be of no worth to us. While all our nations are present at the United Nations and you have observance, observer status for entities like the Vatican and religious orders and the banks and the whatnot, even the CARICOM uh, and, and everyone else has this observer status why don't we have one for our traditional leaders in such a way that we know it is of value to them and to us because that's how they can benefit us they can participate in that discussion they can see what's coming and they can see what's going on they can be prepared at the grassroots level you see this is why all of this is coming together the royal institute then serves as an institute that the royals will 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 facilitate will facilitate where our cultures are preserved where lectures are given where education and and and, and cultural products are moved and organized and publications and things like that we have a whole list of this of, of this cultural industry that would facilitate this institution it would be the basis of our understanding of, of ourselves and the importance of preserving 
our identity without any compromise or cultural of our cultural integrity uh, and 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 be able to produce at a level that can facilitate a society from the grassroot up this vision is very clear to us and as you will see uh, we are very deliberate about it uh, we're working very very hard on it um, and we we have started to uh, establish it in Ghana uh, so today you will see uh, where we are, we've invited our friends like uh, Gregory Keys. <laughs> Welcome, Greg, to the house. Uh, Juan Jose from Spain, Gregory. Um, uh, I'll, I'll introduce Gregory when he speaks, but I, I really hope that you, you take a look at Gregory. Gregory is um, a remarkable architect and an architect that is not ordinary. And um, I pretty much have twisted his arms <laughs> to to be with us and i tell you gregory and i gregory and juan jose and all of us went to africa and i realized that greg is even more african than me that's so that's that's weird <laughs> he was driving like one of those Ghanaians, and i could not even believe it uh but anyway um the 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 we we appreciate the support of our friends uh to come and help realize this vision and um, their, 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 their presence is important because, um, not just because they, they have European heritage, I mean, not, not, not in that, not, not even close. It is because of the expertise in the field. Um, Greg is a leading sustainable development architect um, arrivals, and, and that's why uh, we have asked for his help uh, in, in putting together this uh, edifice of uh, uh, an exemplary um, uh, uh, royal institute in such, that is built in such a way that lasts across time. So again, uh, we'll be able to see much of that today. So uh, enough of me blabbing. I, I thank you very much for listening to me. I think it's important for me just to stretch it out so you're able to follow where we are and uh, so we can move forward with today's program. Uh, we've asked uh, our dear colleague, Tina Shemukasa. Um, I believe Jessica Batema Latte is here as well. Uh, Regina Askia Williams is not able to make it today. Um, and uh, as mentioned, the ambassador Shabala is here. So um, I know some of you are tight in schedule, so we'll quickly uh, have you speak. Uh, before we go to the presentations. Um, as it's required, I would like uh, Kingalai Mori to just say a quick forward before... Uh,
count it as a privilege for me to be part and parcel of this history making thing. And uh, again, my name is Royal Majesty uh, Oba Architect Adiremi Adidapo Alayi Mori of Idu Ocean. And I'm the Secretary Board of Trustee of the entire Nigerian National Council for Traditional Rulers of Nigeria. That's the National Council traditional rulers of Nigeria and uh, representing all the monarchs, about 115 of us, uh, I'm here to witness this. I will look forward to go from strength to strength. We are again using it to commemorate the centenary post almost birthday of the great product of Africa. That's, uh, Nelson Mandela, and uh, we thank God for him, for, for, for showing mercy on this person. He was an enigma. Uh, he stood for selfless service of our humanity. He is a, like a benchmark where we can measure every other person in public service. He served, he lived, and he accomplished. We thank God for his life and the legacies he left. May all our dreams of, of this coming together come to fruition. Amen. And uh, the organizers of this thing is so ingenious. And God will continue to bless you. Uh, the crew, the winning team, in leaps and bounds as you go out and you come in. As you rise up and you lay down, Elid Dumari, the Tana Rock of Ages, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and Omega, we continue to protect you and bless you. Amen. We look forward to be around next year. We start counting and we want to go from strength to strength. That's our prayer and our hope Amen. and our aspirations. Amen. Amen. I want to do a pen my signature.
First of all, let me thank the organizers of this Zoom teleconferencing. And I'm seeing my colleagues, my, my brothers and my sisters all over the places. Uh, my do say, I truly salute for you. Yes, thank you, it's been a while. I hope uh, Jigawa is okay. And my wonderful royal hostess, Queen Awindo, you gave me the wonderful time while coming from the African Union Commission program. Thank you again. I miss the Ghana retreat. And of course, our chairman, who is right there, I, I, I lost him now. That's Bill. No, that's it. Uh, Bill was there. Uh, Bill? William? Bill? Okay. I think he disappeared. Maybe he knew I was coming to mention his name. I thank you all for this privilege to be able to um, view how far we have gone. And of course, we all know that we, when we're talking about SG, Sustainable Development SDG, all the 17 uh, goals, the last one, 17, is to make sure we deepen conversation with institutions and that's where we're coming. We've been ignored, neglected for quite some time. And uh, I think it's good that we are coming together because we believe in the philosophy of cooperating to operate. We have to cooperate to operate and that it makes it easier for all of us. I'm very mindful of what uh, Dr. Wale mentioned uh, but cultural identity. Uh, we can look at it with some kind of, it has to be circumspect about it. Because we know there are some cultural values which are very harmful to our development. And that's what would be some of the things we have been battling in the last three or four years. Uh, female genital mutilation, early child marriage. Uh, we, we need to look Critically, as a culture, there's lots of cultures which are very, very beneficial to us. But the harmful cultural practices, we have to discard it. Um, you, you cannot say enough of all this, some of these harmful cultural practices in Africa. And we, are, we don't want to leave anybody behind. Um, and if you look at the 17 goals of the Sustainable Development, uh, you find out that number five, which is gender equality, says it all. It encompasses all our values. Because if you have the women on board and you have this gender equality, you can go so far in Africa that we've been left behind. The GDP of Africa is being eroded by a quantum 12% because of the value, uh, the less value we give to female and girls education. Uh, but there are a lot of things we have to uh, talk about and walk about because we just don't have to talk about it. We have to do the walking. We have to walk the talk too. So our coming together, I think is, uh, is very germane that we synergize we have to be on the same platform and we cannot afford to leave anybody behind and look at what has, what is happening right now the, uh, the covid 19 we are seeing increasing rate of breaks all over africa different communities this has, there are lots of things we have to i need to talk about gender equality all these are the biases we have to fight along with our coming together as a family, all the kingdoms coming together. Uh, I was looking forward to see Zolani 
Uh, we were with them in Zambia last year. We had the privilege of meeting Kenneth Kaunda, uh, the first prime minister, the first president of Zambia. And he was so excited. He welcomed us. He said, look, we have the king's being for almost uh, a century. The political class have been doing it all by themselves. So, well, we are not invited after we interface. So I'm happy the elders are coming, uh, they are realizing our participation, that the kingdoms have to come together. After all, uh, two, three hundred years ago, there was nothing like Zambia, uh, Nigeria, Benin. We have kingdoms. Even in the Bible, they're talking about by, of, of kingdoms. They're not talking about presidents or prime ministers. So it's our own constituency. This is our own jurisdiction. So we have to work at it and we have to come together. Uh, I can never say enough of that. I'm seeing everybody, I have to yield now. But we don't have, we, we have to be conscious of these goals in addition to our coming together. So that by year 2030, African will be liberated, devoid of uh, pestilence, of poverty, of uh, all these things. Look at our health, health, uh, health administration has collapsed even before. And you know, when you're talking about pandemic, we already had one pandemic before, corona pandemic. And these are the values Pandemic we had before were all this crisis, putting this gender inequality we've been practicing for so long. And that's why we as custodians of heritage, tradition, and culture, we have to come together and make sure that we, we work together and, make, and push Africa to the next level. We need to stand by our change. And that's, I'm so happy with my colleagues over there. These are vibrant traditional authorities all over Africa. And that's what we need to do. I, I want to use that time to say hello to my uh, Erelu, my princess, Dr. Remy Alapo, and my colleague brother, architect, Gregory Case. I saw the wonderful things. Look. And every one of you, every one of you, I say thank you very much. And I yield to some other people to talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kabiesi. Thank you so much. Thank you for your wisdom. May God continue to bless your mind and your heart. Thank you. You remain for us a lighthouse. Thank you. Um, I want to know first if Ambassador Shabala is pressed for time. Uh, if Ambassador Shabala is uh, comfortable in staying with us, we can then uh, defer the program and go accordingly. But if, uh, uh, so Ambassador, uh, would you say something about your condition and say hello to, to everybody, please. Thank you, your majesties and royal highnesses. Uh, this for me is a, a singular honor to um, participate with you um, as our, our guardians. I, and I do so with the utmost humility, um, having grown in a village and uh, having been sensitized to the value, our values in the Ubuntu culture of respect for our elders, respect for our guardians. I've become very mindful um, of the need for the fullest participation of our elders, of our cultural custodians, of the kings and queens, um, their active involvement, not just locally, but all the way through to the international level. Now I've been blessed for a long time um, 
to serve in the uh, international diplomacy. And again, I've done so with great humility. Um, always conscious of my roots, our roots, where are we coming from? And especially our African roots. Um, occasionally I've, I've pondered on just how much perhaps we have become more silent than not in speaking to our African culture, the values of respect for human dignity, ethnicity and cultural diversity, the values which over time have served to sustain us sustain our unity. For a long time, even against outside forces whose motives have been at variance with our own. Now, there is a biblical saying, Ecclesiast, to everything there is a season and a time for paraphrasing all specific activities. There are good reasons why this meeting is taking place at this particular moment. This is a moment of uh, tremendous challenge. At the same time, a moment of great opportunity, perhaps unprecedented opportunity. The COVID-19 has, has been welcomed, when I say welcomed, because of the impacts that the pandemic has had. Now, at the same time, I always, from a spiritual perspective, again, from a cultural perspective, I believe that pandemics crisis should not be resented in courts. I believe that they have to be embraced. Embraced because they provide opportunities for us to more or less to get back. We are being called. The time of reckoning. It's like our spiritual ancestors calling us back in face of this pandemic, calling us back to what holds us together, to our roots, to commune with them making us remember and recall what held our ancestors together, what sustained them in the face even of attacks from outside. So this meeting happening on this occasion at this time it is not by accident. I believe it's, it's a spiritual, in a sense, event. And um, I've always had a lot of respect for, of course, his, uh, his Royal Majesty, King Adedapo Adarami. And the King has uh, placed the discussion of this. Uh, subject in very proper context, more or less touching on the relationship that has existed between, on one hand, the political, our political leadership, and on the other, our cultural custodians. 
in my view, they've been a cultural, our cultural um, custodians, a very silent, but very dignified presence. Um, to some extent, I felt they need their status to be asserted. Uh, it's always, of course, very, it's high, but asserted especially at the international level, outside, especially again, in light of what the pandemic has done to expose, to shine light on the inequalities, on the injustices, on the disparities, which have disproportionately affected people of African descent out in the diaspora and also on the mainland, but especially outside of Africa, mainland Africa. So what's going on is not by accident at all. We are more or less being reminded what has happened to Africa, what, has, what is happening to people of African descent. Their human dignity is being assailed and has been assailed. I live in the United States and last year we commemorated the 16, 19, 400 years of uh, enslavement. Now, the end of slavery has not meant the end of suffering, dehumanization of the condition, the human condition of people of African descent. And COVID-19, the pandemic, has served to shine light on the indignities visited on people of color, blacks and browns, for a long time. And what else has happened? The protests that we have had following the killing of George Floyd and other murders by institutionalized police. This is a fact. This has been ongoing for a long time. It's more or less been become a wake up moment providing more agency to the issues of addressing institutionalized or systemic racism, police brutality, and other inhuman practices. So I say a wake up call and so the protest that's going on, kind of revealing, it's a enough is enough. And they're being done peacefully because that's the intent, non-violently. It's a wake up call, not just to the people directly involved. In this case, we as Africans, mainland Africa, wherever we are, people of and people of color and ultimately everyone, every human being must be awake, speak up and stand up, acknowledge that any inhuman treatment, like any act of injustice is an act of injustice to all, everywhere. 
but especially for persons of African descent. It is extremely important, and this is where our leaders, you, our majesties, our kings and queens, I believe and I feel strongly it is time for us. It is time for us to facilitate a stronger voice, one united voice in international fora, culminating United Nations. This is extremely important for our leaders to speak with one voice, to have the opportunity to participate alongside the political leaders on behalf of our African family and our one humanity. Again, over the years, I've become very conscious of the true meaning of the Ubuntu culture. I am because we are. This is a message I believe that needs to resonate and especially for a, a, a message that can best be articulated by our kings and queens and our cultural leaders, custodians. His Royal Majesty, Adedapo, Aderemi has also spoken and rightly so to the significance of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and highlighting goal number 17, the Partnerships Goal. There's also goal 16, of course, for peace and justice, and goal five, which is part of my vocation gender equality, the equitable, dignified treatment of our women. It so happens I come from a family where our women are the matriarchs. Anyone aspiring on my, from my, on my maternal side to be a a, a, a chieftainess, of course, has to be a chieftainess to, be, to lead the, the tribe. Uh, but spiritually, it, it is. It's my, my, my vocation. Again, there's primary responsibility for us, especially that in Africa. Um, I believe it's being done, but to a large extent possible to address what mistreats or ill treats uh, women folk. But going, speaking uh, generically, the sustainable development goals, of course, are the, as it is, are the, the framework for our active and participation um, locally, nationally, and globally. And it's extremely important for us really to um, enhance, to sharpen our voice. Most importantly, to do a lot more, as much as we can, to promote the implementation of the SDGs. 
Now, COVID-19, sadly, has uh, made this a more difficult challenge. Uh, the projections that we're looking at now from the humanitarian perspective are very grim, especially for us in Africa and some many other developing countries. But again, be that as it may, I believe that Africa over time, historically, has always stood up to the test. Materially, we may be disadvantaged, but what has helped to hold us together has always been this cultural, this the spiritual strength, our moral, spiritual, and cultural strength. That as of the Ubuntu, holding us together as one, especially in adversity, to the extent that we have always ultimately overcome. This is extremely important. There is hope, boundless hope, in Africa and especially among the people of Africa, outside and externally. Looking at the United States, for instance, and elsewhere. The hope, deep sense of hope and togetherness has enabled us to stand up to the challenges, grim impacts of any crisis, including any pandemics. So even the projected pandemic, or there's always been a pandemic of poverty, um, I believe that standing together and behind our leadership, we shall overcome. Lastly, and I've spoken long, but Mr. Chairman, since you invited me, I feel so excited. This is a, a singular opportunity for me to address the royals. I will just say a few words on, uh, on the process very, very briefly, because most important is the message we have gotten that we have reached a point now for the royals to give the green light, the go ahead for us to initiate the process of seeking observer, UN observer status. And I've been privileged to uh, Really, for me, it's a, it's a privilege that my name has been mentioned to take up the, the leadership in this regard. I do so humbly because this for me is perhaps the most uh, important assignment I've had working for our leadership, our kings and queens who have sustained our societies of Africa and they've done so with dignity, with commitment since the creation of time. I will be um, in the coming period, because we started the process somewhat, but I'm, I'm going to uh, um, identify just points of strategy that I will be discussing, okay, reporting on and discussing with the um, our royals and uh, I am fairly familiar with the, the processes around the United Nations. 
I've been privileged to spend perhaps the, the bulk of my professional life, approximately 40 years, uh, international diplomacy. I was trained as a career foreign service officer after my postgraduate. And I've been involved very much actively with the civil society, the nonprofit, the humanitarian, which is part of my vocation. So I'm excited at this opportunity. Most importantly, I feel humbled uh, in a very meaningful way. It's one way of my giving back uh, to our elders for whom I have the utmost respect. Lastly, since I'm also speaking, more or less reporting to our elders, let me express gratitude and that respect, respectfully so, for the work that has been done by the African Views Organization. Um, this project we are discussing now is more or less a byproduct of five years' work. Kind of visionary, in a sense. And it's only right to commend the leadership of the people involved, especially at the helm of this. Uh, organization, our brother, our beloved brother, Dr. Wale Ajibade. Uh, for me, he's my brother, he's maybe my young brother, but he's also my senior because of his enlightened leadership, his stewardship of this organization um, has impressed me his dedication, he meets the challenges, and he's, he's just utter commitment to this um, organization. He's not there simply to, you know, because he's seeking fame and fortune. No, he's there because he has put his heart into this. And I, I've been around quite a while, so, so I'm saying this from my heart. There are very few younger some, uh, people of color, especially from Africa, who have so much professional talent, skills, and they could be doing a lot of other things. Uh, I'm of an economist uh, profession, the cost benefit analysis would have you do a lot of other things. Um, no. It's the heart, the condition of his heart, and the commitment for the common good of Africa. So I pay tribute to him. I also pay tribute to Bill, Chairman Bill Bedon. Again, he's my big brother. Again, he's one who has done, accomplished so much, could be doing a lot of other things. Because these folks are not, they're not paid, paid in terms of financially. No, they make a commitment the sacrifice, the selflessness to accomplish something directly beneficial to the population, to our people now, but more importantly, for posterity. And that's where Brother Bill fits in. There are others, you know, Sister Regina, the Vice President as well. Um, again, you look at how much they've accomplished. She has accomplished a lot. 
but they have the heart to lend their time, their resources, to do, to what? To contribute. Another person, the royal that I've met uh, for the past few years uh, has been uh, Queen Diani, our beloved Queen Diani. I've met and I've worked with her as well. Uh, with our organization, the whole foundation. She has served also as president of this organization. Someone that I have learned a lot from, as I do learn a lot from, especially women, <laughs> our women folk. Um, a lot more members of the board of directors of this organization. So a tribute fittingly so. I would like to make before our royals. So again, thank you so much for this opportunity and especially the privilege of serving, serving our royals by charting the road for UN observer status at the United Nations and through the affiliated agencies and bodies of the United Nations everywhere. Thank you very much and God bless us. God bless our royals and God bless not just the people of African descent, but also our one humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, thank you so much, sir. Um, I have heard, I know you've made over tens of thousands of speeches in your career, and I've been fortunate to witness about a hundred of them. Uh, I've never heard anything close to what you said today. I think it's very historical. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think it's really important. <laughs> Thank you for, for rising to the occasion, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Shabala uh, has been uh, uh, the uh, ambassador representative, permanent representative of uh, Republic of Zambia to the United Nations and to the European Union and many other institutional uh, faculties. Uh, he is uh, certainly happy to, uh, to lead us in charting the way forward with the uh, Intergovernmental Organization for the Royal Institute and our Royal Fathers. And uh, thank you for making this declaration today. Uh, I am sure that you will get the blessings of uh, leaders. And uh, I have uh, specifically requested the presence of uh, the Emir of Dutse and uh, some other kings here with us today. Um, I see uh, some new kings join us. I salute you all. I will address you as uh, as, as we move on. But I, I want to quickly uh, address, uh, I want to quickly bring uh, Emma of Dutse on. Okay. Um, uh, because uh, I um, uh, b because just like the I think it's a good segue uh, or actually it's a good follow up for Ambassador's speech right before the Ambassador spoke uh, King Galayamore spoke uh, King Galayamore is the uh, convener for the Council of uh, Traditional 
leaders of Africa, uh, which has already been granted recognition and observer status at the African Union. I would like him to speak a little bit more on that uh, later. But one of the reasons that it's important to have our leaders present is because of the role that they play in their society. Not only as a figurative leader, but actively engaging in challenges that are so complex and even too big for governments to handle. The best example we could find on this planet Earth today is the work that's been done in Dutse under the command and the leadership of uh, Dr. Nuhu uh, Mohammed uh, Sanusi. I was privileged to meet with him, uh, his son and his emissary, and he he touched my heart uh, uh, in in many ways, and uh, I was surprised actually to stumble across uh, your publication with the title "Reminiscences of the Days in My Life." Um, to uh, I was reading this and I, I was so fascinated. I haven't finished it yet because of the uh, duties that, that I have ahead of me. But I, I agree uh, completely and, and very pleased to see the quote that you started the book with. Say, when you were born, you cried and the world rejoiced. Live your life so that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. I, I, and, and I think you leave that legacy, sir. And when I think of what's possible with the rise of what we are trying to do at the kingdom level, we are going to be able to separate sanity and sobriety from the madness that we have coming from terrorism driven by political factions and all the pseudo-democratic and governance system that's pervading our society and misleading us. So you can see, sir, I'm very hopeful and I know that uh, you are. Uh, I'm just reassuring you, so you, you know. Um, to introduce you properly, uh, it would be my pride uh, and my joy to introduce uh, Queen Bashure, uh, Madam Alima Idris from Zaria, because I want her to welcome you properly to this occasion. Alima, thank you. Um, good evening. Um, it's evening in Nigeria. Anyway, um, I'm sure maybe quite it's afternoon in your place. I hope you can hear me very well. This is trying to fix the button. Um, my name is Halima. Um, I work with the Kaduna State Governor on Creative Arts. And um, it's a privilege to be one of the people that would introduce our royal father, you know, um, even when the whites came to Nigeria, the North was already stable because of how um, our own level of um, leadership used to be and is still the way it is. Um, Mr. Wale, I really appreciate, you know, this um, African views with the Royal Institutes, you know, the way we try as much as possible to, to, to get the Royal Fathers to be part of anything that you know, the, any decision the UN is going to make. So our royal father is one of um, the decision makers in Duse. And um, Alhamdulillah, that God be the glory. He is one of the people that speak for the masses in Nigeria. And um, I would like to thank him. Your royal highness, the platform is yours. I will be very happy to listen to what you have to say. I'm sure what you have to say will cover 
most of what the northern Nigeria is facing today in Nigeria. And um, your input will be very important to us to, you know, to, to make any decision in the, in the future. Thank you very much and welcome to the platform. Thank you, Hadiza. Uh, Wale, I'm very grateful for your invitation. I just received this invitation this morning. And uh, because of the importance of this, I see I have to put up so many things to attend this summit. And I, I don't want to make you cry more. I have a lot to say about you. My first meeting with you two years ago was uh, really memorable. I have never met someone that is so dedicated, so committed to Africanness and to the unity and the purpose of African leadership like Wale. You are particularly, your dedication to this has brought us to this today. And I'm glad to see the array of all the dignitaries uh, my colleagues, the, the, the kings of uh, Africa that are here, and everybody that is here to support this program, I say thank you very much. Uh, I want to say just a few things because uh, I know so many people would like to say many things more. But uh, I will start with uh, uh, this project that Wale started, and I think with the support of your colleagues and friends, it's a very important uh, thing in our lives, and our children particularly. And uh, because this touches on peace, prosperity, security, uh, economic well-being, environmental uh, 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 conservation, and so forth, these are the issues that are bewildering us today, child abuse and the rest. And I'm, 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 I, I am uh, in concurrence with uh, His Majesty Dadipo for the child abuse and the, particularly women and its children in our societies. One of the reasons why uh, we in, 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 in this part of the country, uh, Northern Nigeria, we inherited a lot of problems uh, that 
came with the colonialization and the, even the political leadership that took over from the colonialists. Uh, because we had absolute, in that time, before the colonial administration, absolute power over our own communities and our own people. We are the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. And uh, things were not very well. I wouldn't say, uh, exaggerate on this, that uh, we are, our, my ancestors and our and yours are doing much better. But what they were doing at that time, though, is that it's really different. Uh, our laws that are uh, being uh, d diminished by the, the, by, the uh, by the colonial administration, many of them have got a lot of meaning in them. Uh, the, but th because they don't suit their purpose, they, they change the laws. And these laws are particularly on community uh, leadership, community association, and uh, the role of everybody from the king down to the ward head uh, in community, and everybody has his own role. Now, this has been diminished. Uh, democracy, constitutional democracy has changed all that. So here we are. We are left with really nothing other than the me mediators of peace, prosperity for our own communities if we want to be recognized. And uh, this is what, why this project, uh, while it started, is going to be a very uh, important one to both of us, to Africans, to our children, and to our wives, and to our daughters. Because uh, we can re-figure our own needs because uh, particularly in achieving peace, prosperity, and, and also saving our own environment. Uh, I spoke with uh, Wale two years ago when I was in New York regarding this. We have a project in, in my Emirate, and this project is, is called uh, Suluhu in, in my language, in Hausa, which means uh, conflict resolution. And this, we are working uh, when we, st we started this project, uh, DFAID, the British uh, organ of, uh, 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 came to us and studied our, our, our work on, 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 P on complete resolution. And what we did, we were able to get our governments and uh, the legal uh, authorities, the laws of the, our country, to, to, to be in, uh, in tandem with what we, we suggested. And luckily enough, this project was received a lot of uh, uh, attention. Even uh, Prince Charles, when he came to Nigeria, he invited me to discuss this issue, which we did. And he was very, very, very uh, impressed with what we did, uh, we're, we're, we're doing on the conflict resolution. And he sent the, the following week, we had a visitor from the uh, home office in England to come and, and study our, our project. However, this is not the, the most important thing about this project is uh, that we were able to decongest courts, our courts from litigation, the minor litigation and also the police because we involve, we are, we, we are able to involve both the police authorities and the judiciary in our program. And so that they don't, we don't have any problem when we have a decision because what we believe, Africanness is uh, it's to, uh, 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 it's not, we were not really geared towards litigation going to court. Uh, spending years and months and so forth in the uh, in the police uh, court um, in the police or in the judiciary, what we saw is the conflict resolution, traditional African conflict resolution, is no there is no winner takes all, it is give and take, and so what we do is to try to mediate between con uh, contesting parties, 
be it a, a husband and a wife, be it a businessman and his client, be it be a neighbor and his neighbor, neighborhood, and so forth. So many other things. And we have classified these uh, uh, cases and we are adjudicating based on the local understanding of those people because they don't understand many of them. We don't have to bring in uh, penal court so, so, and so, uh, or, or, or because we can say the constitution or the law of the country said so, so, and so. This does not matter. People want a resolution, a resolution that will give everybody a chance to feel that he is wanted by the community. So we establish in every community in our emirate and, and, and uh, a Suluhu scribe who will, who will uh, register every day on a daily basis, mediate on, on, on issues, and also at the same time make uh, these issues public to the rest of the community so that in the future, those other people who have got similar cases, they know how to resolve them. So we trained so many young people uh, and also our own uh, we have a system uh, under me, the EMEA, there the are district heads, and then there are village heads, and there are ward heads. These people were trained to, 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 to be complete managers so that they can resolve issues that affect uh, our, our lives and community. And to, to, to keep it all, a summary is that the first year we did this, we were able to resolve over 3,000 cases within one month. And this is an unprecedented, even the courts, nobody can, you know, can even imagine. Uh, we have 1.5 million people in my emirate and we are able to resolve uh, uh, 30,000, uh, not 300,000, 30,000 cases in, in the first month. This is really unprecedented and the people were happy. And so the courts were happy that we have decongested their uh, cases. The police were happy that we were able to resolve any non-criminal case, we resolve it in, within the, the contesting parties. And so after a few, six months, seven months, uh, this uh, project was able to attract a lot of interest from people who went to see what we are doing. And uh, thank God now, uh, this project now, uh, we have got all the data, I will send it to Wale sometime when, when, when he will study the data. But, but uh, the data is so impressive and uh, we have reduced the cases. And I would say in my emirate, particularly my, my state in my emirate, uh, there was, uh, Boko Haram, uh, these are terrorist uh, organizations that uh, build uh, mostly northern Nigeria and uh, partly the south. But, but these Boko Haram were in all our neighborhood. But because we have got a system of reporting our, our, our uh, people within, within the system, our system, and we have got, uh, we're vigilant in terms of who comes to our community and what he does and what he, so we are able to, to escape the Boko Haram terrorism in our, in our state. And also now with all these kidnappings and things that are happening in the Northwest zone of Nigeria, uh, we are lucky, thank God, we are lucky we don't have any of these because we are doing that. But on the other thing, on the other hand, we look at, you can't do uh, uh, complete resolution alone. You have to empower people. People have to be empowered to be, uh, to be able to, to, to sustain their lives. So we, what we, we, we are doing uh, within our religious uh, uh, understanding, we, have, uh, we, are, we, are, we are collecting uh, 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 tax of the, from the wealthy people and distribute it to the poor. And this has also helped in uh, 
understanding between the, the rich and the poor. And in every community that we collect such taxes, we are paying it to the poor in that community. We don't take it to another community. So because of that, we broadcast who paid his taxes for the community. And so these people are always, the common man or the poor are always respecting the, 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 the rich because they know they are sustaining their lives. Uh, let me say, just yesterday I concluded paying this year's tax. We collected uh, equivalent of 300 million dollar, uh, naira. Uh, I don't know, today's price maybe a one million dollar. It's not much in New York. But, but uh, in, our com in our community of 100, 1, 1, 1.5 million people, we distributed the money and, uh, and the food stuff was 300 million uh, yesterday. And, and many of them, these people who have nothing to, 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 to feed on, uh, have got enough food now for at least five months, six months to, to live on. And this money, this is what we do. And uh, people are always, uh, uh, we make it public to those who give and to those who take the, who are assisted with this, uh, with this uh, tax collections. Then our environment is most important. Environment is part of the problems in this country, particularly in Africa. We have destroyed our environment. We have destroyed our, not only our culture, goes with the environment. If you destroy a forest, you are destroying the culture and the, the livelihood of those people. So what we are doing now is the, we have encouraged young people to go into uh, environmental rehabilitation. And this is what we do uh, to rehabilitate our environment, uh, particularly those of us in the sub-Saharan uh, region where uh, the, 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 the vegetation is very scarce. Uh, we are doing that uh, even two, day, two days ago, um, many of our young people were distributed uh, several, uh, uh, about three million seedlings to young people to, to, to plant in their neighborhood. And this is going on right now. So if you, you put them together, all these things bring in element of peace and uh, political harmony. Because uh, upbringing and moral character of any community depends on how well the leaders or the elders uh, pay attention to. So what we do, we are trying, we are watching our young people, we are watching them, we are, we are encouraging them uh, to, to seek their uh, level of uh, education or trade or uh, uh, any other, anything that they want to do. We support them with uh, uh, other, other um, uh, consultancies, uh, uh, public uh, uh, lectures and so forth. So through that, we're able to put our communities together. Uh, well, I don't want to take much of the time because uh, I know other people are, but we, as the time goes on, I, I may chip in some other things, but thank you very much. <laughs> I could listen to you all day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Your Majesty. Your Highness, you, you were uh, ambassador. This is why we have to have the voices of our royal fathers at the UN. Yes. Um, you know, one of the great things that Nelson Mandela did before uh, he passed was to establish um, the elders organization. Uh, this organization of the elders, um, you may know, uh, include um, people like um, Mary Robinson, who I adore and cherish because of her wisdom, and, and she knows it. <laughs> um, uh, people like Desmond Tutu and uh, Dalai Lama and, and people like that, great people. Um, I think 
that already points us in the direction that the wisdom of our elders are imperative to our development and self-determination. And you can see uh, from what the Emma has described, uh, how things are done. Uh, this is something that we want everyone to learn about and see how they can too emulate uh, these successes that the Emma has described happening in Dutze. I thank you so much, sir. I hope that you stay with us uh, to 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 uh, please contribute more to uh, the deliberation. Uh, but be, does anyone have any question for the Emma before we go to the next subject? Um, right. Yes, I do. Oh, great. <laughs> this is Alima. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I want um, to know um, what the, the Emir, or if, I don't know if he's going to speak on behalf of the other Emirs in the Northern region, um, how hard they are trying in um, bringing peace into the, the country, especially with whatever is happening here. I might not have to mention that, but um, we all know Nigeria is facing um, um, a lot of insecurities within the, the country. And um, it is believed that most times the royal fathers Uh, well, also very in the them along because they I don't know if they have anything in store we can use or anything that can help us um, think about the peace and prosperity um, for for the summit. Well, thank you, Alima. I you, I think you know more than, <laughs> than I do possibly in terms of what other Amians are doing. But my we we have. Uh, uh, we have uh, an, a, a, a system in northern Nigeria uh, because we have got a council of uh, traditional rulers uh, or council of, uh, in every state has a council of chiefs or, or traditional rulers or emirs, whatever, they, depending on the, uh, the, the state. And uh, these councils also, we have a national council which uh, uh, His Majesty uh, Adedapo is a member. He, he can tell you more. Uh, we discuss issues of this nature at the national, at the state, at the national level, particularly things that affect our our future and our the future of our our communities. Uh, what we do in the north is that uh, beside the council of chiefs in every state or Council of Amias in every state. Uh, we also have inter-state inter uh, arrangements. Uh, all the, what I told you we are doing, uh, either those Amias that are interested in this, Halima, uh, are, are coming to us and asking what we do. And the same, the same thing, what, what they do of interest to us, we go to them and ask what they do. But, but you see, our problem, the traditional institution in northern Nigeria, the problem is that we, the, the, we, are, we are in direct conflict with the politicians uh, because they don't understand our role. They see us as a stumbling block because we control the community and they need the community for their political uh, uh, survival. So we are complete. We are competing on a on a product, mm. the community, which is a product, the ownership of that of that community. So this is why sometimes you find that some areas get run into problem with their with their governors, and uh, and uh, because they cannot tow the same line with them. But we we believe we can work together with us, the politicians and the traditional institution, we can work together. And I want to say what, what I think the, uh, the uh, Royal Institute should do is to encourage traditional institutions at local level to work with their with politicians 
so that we would be able to understand each other. We are not competing on anything other than we are trying to make the, the uh, to make uh, the welfare of our welfare of our people and their their whatever uh, needs, uh, you know, we support them so that they can achieve what they want to achieve. So if we g the the uh, uh, Royal Institute can work with particularly with our politicians, it will be much easier for us to, to participate fully and uh, support the, this program. Thank you, Adimi. Wale, Wale, I want to take five, ten minutes to go and pray. I will come back. All right, sir. I will have a question for you when you do. Thank you. Okay. May God hear your prayers, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, oh, wow. Um, that's so soothing uh, to, to, to hear. And um, thank you, Alima, for rising to the occasion. Do you have uh, any uh, comment to add before we go to the next regarding what the Emma said? Yeah, um, um, yes. Um, well, I believe, um, as His Royal Highness said, um, most of the problems we have, the insecurity issues, the domestic violence issues, and other things that, you know, are mostly affecting the the grassroots or the poor people um, is mostly the responsibility of the royal institutions. But um, I believe we have a challenge, which, by God's grace, this platform would try as much as possible to see that they bring a solution to the problem or they bring harmony, whereby the two parties can look at each other as partners and not rivals. So that's what I want to add. Thank you very much, Mr. Wale, for the opportunity. <laughs> You're brilliant. Thank you so much, my sister. Thank, Thank you. Very you. Much. Thank you for right. brilliant. Thank you. We're so lucky to have you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, we've been talking so much about Royal Institute, and it remains a mystery to perhaps uh, some few of us. So I think uh, perhaps uh, we should bring the Royal Institute to bear so that uh, everyone can understand what it is and then we can begin to ask questions and how we can support it. Before I do that, I want to welcome uh, some royal elders. I want to start by uh, my brother, His Royal Highness, uh, Chief Zulani Mkiva from South Africa. I want to acknowledge his Royal Majesty, my uncle, <laughs> um, King Robinson Tanyi from uh, uh, the Cameroon. And uh, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, my Royal Father from Ivory Coast, uh, uh, His Royal Majesty, King Chivizi, um, welcome, sir. I hope you can hear me. I see you sitting on your throne, which is beautiful. I'm so happy to have been able to sit next to you <laughs> and, and, and enjoy time together. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, that's wonderful. I want to take also this time to uh, move to the next uh, again program where we will be talking about the Royal Institute. And to talk about the Royal Institute means to talk about Nana Otulate, the Osea de Trio, the, uh, <laughs> welcome sir. Now, um, I want to just briefly uh, acknowledge one thing first, Happy birthday to you. And to celebrate your birthday, you look so handsome today, I will sing you a very short special song, which goes like this. Happy birthday, happy birthday, we love you. Happy birthday and may all your dreams come true. When you blow the candle, one light stays aglow. And that's the light that's in your eyes wherever you go. Happy birthday to you, sir. Welcome. Yeah. Now, um, when we 
continue to deliberate on the Royal Institute and we begin to advocate for the requirements of land and the requirement of funds and the requirement of actually establishing the Royal Institute. Uh, while we got so many supports from many kings, um, then now Tulate was the first to uh, take that challenge on and decided to take a stab at it. We thought it was some kind of joke, but then uh, things started to manifest itself. Um, he is an incredible man. As you see, his birthday is today. It wasn't planned that way. This just happened. And as Jessica told me yesterday, there's a divine intervention there. And I cannot agree less. Jessica is the daughter of Nanao Tulate. So to introduce Nanao Tulate properly and to introduce uh, this uh, segment of the Royal Institute and his involvement and his vision uh, and so on and so forth, I would like to invite our Queen Mother, Queen Nana Awindo, Nana Ima Awindo uh, from Ghana, to please help us introduce Nana Atulati properly and help us set the stage for uh, for, for this uh, for, for his vision about the Royal Institute, and then we'll go to the architects. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, good afternoon from Ghana, or is it good evening now? It's 5.53 p.m. from Accra. Um, good afternoon, Your Royal Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, King Adedepo. Good afternoon, my special wish and special greetings to you. Um, special regards to all our eminent uh, Royal Majesties and Royal Highnesses on this uh, summit. I'm most excited and most blessed, honored to be part of this. Um, it's not time for me to speak yet, but I have been given the opportunity to introduce Nana Otulate. And Dr. Wally, honestly, I was looking forward for you to call on uh, Jessica to do that because she knows her daddy so much <laughs> and he can tell us a lot about Nana Otulate. But I will take the opportunity to say how how honored and blessed I am to have gotten to know Nana Otu um, for the past year or so that we have come closer. Um, it's been amazing and I've seen him as a man of vision, um, not just a chief in Ghana, but an eminent one and a development oriented one as such. Uh, Nana took responsibility to handle this project in such a way that was unprecedented. 
I have seen our chiefs and queen mothers being very development oriented of late, especially the last 10 years. But for somebody to boldly take responsibility to front this kind of project that is at its magnitude, I mean, I was quite impressed. And I, I should tell you, Dr. Wally and everybody else that most of us who have agreed to be part of this process did it because of the way Nana took the lead and made us feel that we are all part of this and we need to get to the end of it. We need to see the success of it. And that is why when you all came to Ghana, you noticed that we were all for the project. And so the, the, the few words I want to say about Nana is that you all are at the right place. You've got the best person to lead this project in Ghana, especially. And we are very excited that you chose to um, probably the first one or one of it in Ghana. And, and I think we, we want to assure you, even before Nana talks, we want to assure you that you are the right place and we are going to do the best we can to make sure that this project see the day of light. And uh, with not uh, much ado, I'd like to welcome Nana to the platform and also wish him a happy birthday. I have wished him birthday already today but I want to use this platform to say, Nana, happy, happy birthday. You are such an amazing man, an amazing chief. You are looking for the good for your people and you have extended it beyond your community to Ghana, to Africa and to the world. Because eventually when this project is best and we all see how it will begin in Ghana and bringing all the world together, I know that your name will be itched somewhere there that yes, you played a major role. Happy birthday, Nana. Happy birthday. Thank you.
everybody on this platform. Um, what I have to say now is uh, I want to say my active contribution to towards uh, Luzon's social challenges faced in my kingdom as well. And then uh, first of all, before I start speaking anything, um, <clears throat> I would like to first of all give special thanks goes to the Almighty God for giving us this opportunity, as well as the Royal Majesties, Queen Mothers, and then special guests, ladies and gentlemen, everybody on this platform. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And also my special thanks also go to Dr. Wally and then his team for giving us this platform to be a part of birthing forth the Royal Institute of Global African Culture and Traditions. Your hard work does not go unannounced. I'm also thankful, thankful to all who have made it <clears throat> to this conference. Thank you all, everybody who is here for coming. God bless you. I'm also saying <clears throat> one thing about the current social problems in Ghana is that they form a chain from one thing leading to the another. Some of, some of the current issues in Ghana can be blamed on the government and partly on ourselves. Also, modern lifestyle has taken a toll in creating some of these issues. And then also, in view of this, I've gone a step further in offering some political solution to the social problems facing my kingdom and that matter gone. You, I can also talk about the production of, I can also talk about food production. It's one of the major social security issues in Ghana. The change in climate partners is another catalyst of social problems in Ghana that has really affected the food production in the country. Water for domestic purposes is also affected by these adverse conditions and some unconventional practice along and in surface water such as uh, such as rivers. I am also talking about uh, water for domestic purposes is also affected by those adverse conditions and some unconditional, <coughs> unconventional parties along and in surface water, such as uh, Sorry, I'm also saying that I've gone step 
Yeah. Yeah. I've gone a step further in offering some practical solutions to the social problem facing my kingdom and for that matter, Ghana. Food production is one of the major social security issues in Ghana. The, ch the change in climate pattern is another catalyst of social problems in Ghana that has really affected the food production in the country. Water for domestic purposes is also affected by these adverse conditions and some unconventional practice along and in surface water such as rivers, streams, and lakes. To help solve these issues, we have sunk four homes for portable drinking water. We have also gone further by treating we are also gone further by treating the groundwater and commercializing them as bottled water and sachet water. This industry has contributed to youth employment in the community. I have encouraged agriculture, especially promoted, especially promoted the growing of cash crops such as cocoa, yeah, and other cash crops. Cocoa farmers in my kingdom earn some, <coughs> earn some income from the process. The gap between the rich and the poor is so wide in Ghana, I'm telling you this. That poverty is not only a major problem in Ghana, but the rest of the continent as well. In order to solve some problems associated with poverty in my community, we set a fund to support variants but needy children in school to tertiary level. We are also setting up a vocational and technical training program to support the non-formal education. So I'll continue. <clears throat> non formal education. This and many other active developmental projects are what I am implementing in my kingdom. In conclusion, I believe the time has come for the traditional authority to be actively involved in nation building. This is what I'm saying. Then from here, then I would like to go to the Royal Institute of Global African Culture and Traditions. This is an African proverb saying, no one eats in a bowl that is not washed. At least if you get some food and eat, you need to wash your bowl before you can get another one. And also I'm saying this, about the COVID-19. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we could not hold this conference in person and in our numbers. However, with God, all things are possible. It's our prayer that a year by this time, COVID-19 will vanish from the earth and we shall be free for to fulfill our normal duties and give honor to the Almighty God. In order to establish the Royal Institute of Global African Institute and Cultures, we needed to register the African View Organization in Ghana. I am glad to inform you that the registration of the African View organization has been successfully completed with Registered General of Ghana in July 2020. We, we have to also decide to 
show details of the registration if it's possible. And also, we continue here showing that uh, for the fulfillment of the Institute's objective, we have initiated the process of collaboration with the University of Ghana. We, we presented proposals to the director of the Institute of Environment and Sanitation Studies, head of Department of Soil Science, Dean of School of Performing Arts, head of History Department, head of Department of Archaeology and Heritage Studies, director of the Institute of African Studies, and, and the dean of the School of Performance Arts. We have written to all of them and then I hope very soon they will call us and then we can discuss that as well and maybe we write a, a memorandum of understanding between the University of Ghana and the Global African Institute to set up this institution. Also, we are looking forward to inaugurate the African Views Organization in Ghana here. The inauguration date will be communicated to the head office for approval and support, which I think all of you will come and support us when the day is due and when the head office who has approved that. I also want to talk about the, the land demarcated for the project is registered under the, under the land commission in Kumasi. Kumasi is almost the central part of Ghana and also is the second largest city in Ghana as well, in the Ashanti region of Ghana. The land is located in the Asankari, Asanti Achim South, in the Ashanti region of Ghana. And then we've done so much and I hope very soon everything will be successful. We also want to talk about the size of the land as well. It must be communicated, communicate to you. The land size, is, area of the land is about a, a minimum of 50 acres and a maximum of 250 acres. Um, depending on um, how the elders and the supporters will agree for us to choose in between 50 acres and a maximum of 250 acres it has been proposed. That's what I'm trying to say. The site location is accessible in the Accra Kumasi Highway and about 170 eight kilometers from Accra and a maximum of two hours drive from the outskirts of Accra. Nothing is eternal in this world, not even our problems. Uh, that's said by once just Chaplin. However, Mandela's legacy for promoting social justice fight against poverty, and then leading culture of peace throughout the world and eradication of racial injustice is life on. It still lives on, all right. So let's give a prize to you. Um, Mr. The, the former president Nelson Mandela, as well as Martin Luther King, people who took peace and justice.
So I will end here and say, long live Royal African Institute, long live African views and the whole world. Thank you very much. Thank you, your highnesses. Bye-bye for now. And I thank everybody who has listened to me. Happy, happy birthday today. Today is really my birthday. Mm -hmm. And these people have made my day. I really enjoy it. Thank you and God bless you all. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Nana. Thank you indeed. And uh, <clears throat> thank you, Nana Ima. Um, actually, uh, I uh, wanted you to also say something in addition to... Thank you.